you to Sydney Nichols. She is my current community relations intern and is doing a has done an amazing, fabulous job, and she's headed off to U Indy here within a month. So I'm definitely going to miss her, and I'm going to let her present the good news tonight. Thank you, Maria. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, there certainly is plenty of good news to present. Um, I'd like to begin by sharing that the Mount Vernon Community School Corporation Food Service served a total of 344 families with 3,440 free meals for those 18 and younger throughout five Mondays over this summer. And um, all three Mount Vernon Elementary schools have also received national recognition for their commitment to empowering students and were each named a Project Lead the Way Launch Distinguished School. Um, continuing, a recent Mount Vernon High School graduate, uh, Madison Carnes, was selected to serve as the Indiana FFA State Sentinel. And this will be Mount Vernon High School's first ever FFA State Officer. Um, Mount Vernon High School also, um, their JAG program, Jobs for American Graduates, um, their sponsor and teacher is James Cochran, and he was named an outstanding specialist by achieving extraordinary outcomes for JAG program participants. Um, as for community connections, several Mount Vernon teachers' favorite books are currently being featured in a display at the Fortville Vernon Township Public Library. And going off of that library, uh, Dr. Parker's book, Bonanza, was a hit with the students that he connected with at his events. Um, the book clubs were full through the sixth grade and had a healthy number of participants through the 11th grade. So special thanks to the Mount Vernon Education Foundation who provided each of the students with their book and also to the Fortville Vernon Town Township Public Library for their partnership. Um, and as part of the Indianapolis Colts leadership football team blood drive, a successful blood drive was held at the Mount Vernon High School with 60 donors, donors and 58 units of blood equating to 168 lives saved. Um, as for noteworthy media, Dr. Parker shared an editorial celebrating how Mar Mount Vernon schools, students and staff, rose to COVID challenges this year with a focus on mental health for all Mount Vernon students and staff. And you can find additional information and links in the board packet. Awesome, thank you so much, we appreciate it. Thank you. Item 5.2 on our agenda. Is this working? You're right, it doesn't sound as loud as it did before. Um, 5.2 on the agenda is Mount Vernon Middle School construction updates. Uh, Mr. Derek Shelton. Uh, thank you. We are moving right along with our construction project. The art room is scheduled to be punched on Friday, meaning hopefully we'll be done by Friday. Friday, so it's looking good. Um, they will still be able to use a majority of the cafeteria for the students at lunchtime, but we did have to take a little bit out because we had to punch those holes in the walls. Um, but as as of today, knock on wood, the project is still on schedule to be completed towards the end of September. No. <laughs> They've done a great job. I'm really happy. Yeah, to staying on schedule. Team. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, did I interrupt you or is that, was that? Nope, that's good. Okay, you're good. All right, item 5.3. Gosh, now I feel like I'm yelling at you. I'm sorry. Turn down the teacher voice. Okay. 
Item 5.3 on the agenda is social emotional learning and other curriculum. Dr. Yeah, this is something that we had announced um, outside of a board meeting last month, but I want to share that the administration will form a committee of stakeholders with the majority of the makeup of the committee being non-school personnel. This committee will be charged with looking at curriculum, both state mandated and the non-mandated curriculum to help make recommendations for clarity for the purpose of ensuring that all students have the opportunity to learn at high levels. Shortly after the start of the school year, we will communicate the meeting dates and begin collecting names of individuals who are interested in serving on this committee. So we're looking forward to having this conversation with um, our parents and community members, as well as a few staff members. Great, okay. Item 5.4 on the agenda is the tiered health and safety protocols, Dr. Parker. Thank you so much. Um, as you know, we've been working on this quite a bit um, in the last few months, and most of our um, important information came in a flurry of information in the last couple of weeks, particularly last school week. Um, I have asked both, uh, actually three folks um, are gonna join me in presenting this to you tonight. Um, this is um, our health and safety facilities protocols for the 21-22 school year. Um, everybody, if you haven't gotten a copy, there is a copy of this. It's a three-page document, front and back on the first, and then the third page. Um, this is um, updated from what you saw in May. Um, we are going to have Mr. Chris Smedley, our assistant superintendent, uh, Ms. Tracy Furness, our corporation um, registered nurse and in charge of um, health services, as well as Derek Shelton, all take a, a little piece in providing information to you during this report. Oh, excuse me, Derek is our director of operations, everybody, and um, is also our, our chief safety officer, so he's involved in this as well. So to get this kicked off, I'm going to hand it over to um, Mr. Smedley. Okay, so yeah, to, just to provide a little background information uh, regarding the work that we've put in since the last school year ended, and actually this, this first item on this timeline uh, was actually uh, approved during the May board meeting, and that was the tiered response system that we first uh, had the board approve in May related to what our response would be based on percent of absences due to illnesses. Uh, and then Mr. Shelton will be providing you an update to that tiered response um, plan here shortly. Then on June 30th, the governor's mask mandate for schools was lifted with one notable exception, giving school boards around the state jurisdiction over implementing preventative measures to protect the health and safety of, of their students and staff, such as masking, distancing, and disinfecting. The one important exception is related to masks uh, on a school bus. So anyone riding a school bus still must be fully masked while riding the bus, whether they've been uh, vaccinated or not. Uh, and that is that is a federal mandate uh, issued by the U.S. Department of Transportation. So that's something that we need to continue to adhere to throughout uh, throughout the year, at least starting off until that's lifted. Then on uh, July 9th, the Indiana Department of Health announced that schools are still required to conduct contact tracing investigations and quarantine those individuals who are determined as a close contact and who are unvaccinated to a positive case since COVID is a communicable disease and it still needs to be reported to the county health department. Also on July 9th, the CDC re released its guidance for COVID prevention in K-12 schools across the country for the upcoming school year. This detailed information is linked in our plan and is what we aligned our protocols contained throughout this plan. One final note of importance, uh, Hancock County currently ranks fifth in all of the 92 counties across the state of Indiana with its percent of population who are fully vaccinated. More specifically, in our Mount Vernon community, uh, made up of families within the Fortville and McCordsville zip codes, we have almost 80% of our eligible population who are fully vaccinated. So with that, I'll turn things back over to Dr. Parker. Thank you very much. So um, for those following along, we're looking at the bottom of page one where it states MVCSC actions related to health and safety. That first solid bullet, um, we are going to indeed um, quarantine, even though that was something we were hoping not to have to do, but uh, we feel more than duty bound to do that. Uh, we will be conducting contact trace investigations uh, those who are vaccinated can share those, that information with us. Nobody is required to at any time. 
if a, an individual is um, determined to be a close contact um, and they happen to be vaccinated, the parent could state that at that time. Um, and then we would not have to quarantine um, by the rules and recommendations that we've received from multiple agencies. So we wanted to let you know that is our recommendation. Um, additionally, um, we will provide all traditional extended absence policies um, to students who are quarantined. This is something schools have experienced for years. Um, for one reason or the other, a child must leave school for an extended period of time and we need to be able to manage that. We will be able to use our traditional methods in order to do that. Um, we will give um, excused absences when we quarantine a child from school. Um, that is something that we felt was the right thing to do um, because we were hoping not to quarantine, uh, but regardless, we don't feel the kids should have to um, have any worries with their attendance record because that wouldn't have worked um, well for us anyway. So um, we are indeed going to contact trace as well as um, quarantine close contact individuals. And if somebody's a close contact without a vaccination, they wouldn't have to be quarantined. And then students would get 10 extra excused days or however many days they would need for that quarantine. Um, actually, Mrs. Furness is gonna talk all about that here pretty soon. Um, no, you're going to talk about the testing. Um, Mr. Shelton will talk about um, some of the other things that we're talking about. But I'm going to um, offer the microphone up here, please, to Tracy Furness, our corporation nurse. Um, we're doing some pretty cool things that I don't know of any other corporation that's doing. Um, and her department practiced it last year. And I'll turn it over to you, Tracy. Good evening. Um, along with what Dr. Parker just mentioned, we are going to continue to offer the Binex testing um, for our students. Just to give you a little history, um, we kept it to a small group last year. We only did it with uh, in-school exposures. Um, we felt like we had a better grasp on where the exposure was. Um, and we were new to the to the testing process. This year, we um, plan to move forward and open up the testing to not only um, the in-school exposures, but out-of-school exposures, um, and to our staff. Uh, we'll take reports from the local health department because sometimes they do communicate with us when a student has been a close contact. They verified it in the past, and we will take parent report. Um, I'm also in the works with the state um, uh, Department of Health, um, the school nurse representative, with bringing the PCR testing to our schools. Um, this is in the works. We just got some information today. Um, but uh, the benefit to this is um, with the Binex now testing, it's a rapid test. Um, there is potential to have a false negative. So we are only to use those on uh, students or staff that have no symptoms um, and have been identified as a close contact, meaning they were exposed um, sitting closer than six feet without a mask for longer than 15 minutes. This PCR, in the case that we would have um, a student that has symptoms, if we use the Bionex Now testing, we would still have to refer them out to get the PCR test. So it's just another added step for the parent, um, if, even if we would test them in school. So having the PCR on campus in our hands, we would send it out overnight. Um, PCR is also commonly known as the lab test. It's the, the one that gets sent off. Um, and the, um, the, excuse me, the um, the false positive rate is is it's much more reliable. Excuse me um, than the Binex now the rapid testing. So, with that, I can. If there aren't any questions, Kelly, did you? Have a I did have a question. Yeah. So, is there a limit on the number of tests? Like, if a student needs a six tests, there's not a limit to that. Or, I guess I don't know the cost and all that, but. There I is no cost make, okay. to us. The state is supporting oh, this. Okay. When it comes to the PCR, um, the information that I received today is that they had partners that they were working with, um, and they just they have a supply route set up for us. Um, the health department has. They've worked really well with the school nurses. We place our order. We get them within a day or two. Um, I don't have any other details about how that supply chain will work and who we're sending it to, um, but I was 
really uh, impressed with the fact that when we reached out, they came, they um, responded very quickly, um, and we're very pleased to hear that that we are willing to add additional testing to the school district. Well, I hope you won't need any of them, but I like that you can get as many as you need if we do need them. So that's good. Thank you. Question: Before a student's tested, are we reaching out to the parents for consent to test? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. The right to refusal is always first and foremost. Um, the way the process works, actually, the parents required to bring them in to do it, and they will be with them when it happens. And it's because we're hoping to return a child from a quarantine early. Yeah, and, so, and I'm sorry. We're not, we're not going to do it when the kids are in school. And to add on to that, um, as Dr. Parker said previously, the parent would bring the student um, that morning to test. As soon as we, 15 minutes later, as soon as we had the negative test result, they were able to take them directly to the school with a note um, that verified their negative test result with the, um, the PCR um, or any other additional testing. We would wait, especially if they have symptoms and they're sick, we would wait and our plan is to wait until the parent got to the school because either way they're going to have to go home because they ha they're symptomatic and they're not feeling well then we would test with the parent present um, and we would just handle the the rest of the testing from there submitting the testing excuse me um, on this note Tracy um, how well did this go last year and, and how would you characterize the the number of folks who took advantage of this once we had it finally available towards the end of the year as word caught on um, and we were getting students back on day eight um, we probably had I would say at least 75 percent of a quarantine group that signed up um, to come and have their students tested and this was K through 12 we had kindergartners uh, our last week of school our one of our kindergartners kindergarten classes and um, it was going to get them back on the day of the kindy 500 um, so that was very important to parents um, and the kids were troopers they sat in the car the parents there um, we, we go ahead and still continue to swab for them uh, if we get into the PCR and the high school students we we would consider self swabbing it if we're able um, these are all all little kinks that we'll have to work out and maybe change as we go if we see that there's a demographic that does you know um, better than others then we'll continue to adjust Derek, you know, share the next couple of points. Uh, yeah, we will make every attempt possible to arrange classroom furniture so that we can keep kids at least three feet apart from each other. Obviously, it'll be difficult with some rooms that have tables instead of desks and, and some rooms that are smaller with larger class sizes, but we will do our best to, to keep that organized. We will also continue to mandate uh, updated seating charts on a daily basis from our teachers as well as our bus drivers so that in case it comes to, to contact tracing that we have an accurate um, data on who's sitting where in, in close contact um, of course I'm going to be the lucky one who gets to tell the bus drivers that they have to wear masks even though they are um, vaccinated but that just goes along with state requirements and guidelines at this time that everybody on a bus will wear a mask including <coughs> the driver and we're taking a trip tomorrow to Center Grove and we all have to wear a mask as we go so you know that that uh, legislation applies to all of us through and through so we will do the best that we can to organize our our processes to make sure that we can keep the data as up-to-date and accurate as possible and finally let's talk a little about communication as Tracy makes her way back to the microphone um, um, mrs. Furness shared our tiered health and safety plan with the Hancock County um, Health department and they were so appreciative of it and they asked us a great question and that question is um, how are you going to track this it's like that's a great question I think we've got it figured out I think we we do have it figured out and everything's subject to change um, of course once we get started with this uh, with our communication the the idea we had was um, to mimic what the state had already implemented with the the county advisory levels that we continued to see that um, they updated every two weeks uh, we came up with um, a system to implement within our district internally um, this system would allow us to um, track our um, absences due to illnesses this is not a new concept 
Um, I have been tracking these percentage rates uh, in support of uh, the communicable disease reporting process um, that they've had uh, the school nurses responsible for uh, for years now. Um, we do have a 20% threshold that says, hey, this is the mark that you've got to reach out to your local health department, start working with them, um, and then they advise us on what they need us, what the next step will be. Um, and it's not always school closures, but it can result in that. Um, we base it per building. Um, this is not a district-wide percentage, 20 percentage rate that we track. Um, we, for example, at Fortville Elementary, were at 20%, we would figure out what we needed to do to um, bring that, start bringing that, turning that percentage back down, um, and the rest of the district would move on with their, their regular day. Um, with that said, we are going to continue to track um, we'll be posting on each school building's uh, website a page on their page um, what color we're currently in uh, for that for that day. We'll we'll update it weekly as long as we stay under 10 percent of absences due to illness illness within that particular building. As soon as we hit the 10 percent threshold, we will start to. Um, we will update this color daily um, and ensure that if we start creeping closer to the 16 percent which puts us in to wearing of masks we have had plenty of notification and plenty of time um, to try to uh, put our controls in place to ensure we don't continue to move towards that 16 percent One other perspective, because I wanted to see um, what a percentage rate spike may be. So um, our wonderful data steward um, provided some information to me from the 1819 school year. And basically, we saw a spike just before spring break in the 1819 school year, a spike just before spring break in all three elementaries in the middle school that year. And I think it slightly exceeded 6% um, absence due to illness. Um, the high school that same year had five spikes um, equally scattered throughout the year that never um, hit the 6% mark. Now, I certainly do not expect um, those rates this coming school year. Um, I've already had my first cold um, last week. And I think I haven't had a cold in a couple of years. Um, so I expect that there's going to be a few more absences due to illness than we would see in a typical pre-pandemic year, um, but we hope desperately that those don't spike. And if they do, um, we hope that those are for a very short time because we've learned so much during the pandemic about how to mitigate the spread of viruses and germs and bacteria and all that neat stuff um, that spreads around schools. Um, so do you guys have any questions um, about communication or anything of that nature before Tracy takes a seat? I will say, um, I think Tracy mentioned this, thanks Tracy, that um, we are still tracking all of this and things um, are likely to change to some degree. Um, we will communicate any changes as soon as possible. Um, at this point, we're using the best advice and uh, legal opinions that we can get. And again, I want to point to the other end of the table, Amy Matthews, our corporation attorney is here. If you have any legal questions to ask her board, um, you're certainly welcome to do that. Um, but without that, with, with it, without anything else or any other questions, um, we'll close this report and then Derek will be bringing this back as an action item later. I appreciate all the work everyone's put into this. I know it's a lot of time and, and changes and I appreciate all the efforts you guys have, have put into it, so thank you. Um, at this point, I don't know, this is not on the agenda, but Greg, I want you to know this Rodney has died, so does that matter? I don't know if that matters. Oh, okay, I saw it and I thought I should tell you. Okay, um, so the next item on our agenda are public comments regarding agenda items, and we do have three people who've signed up to speak, and uh, as I said earlier, you'll come to the podium, you'll have three minutes to speak, and I'll call you up, you'll give your name, your address, and whatever group you're with, and we'll um, hear your comments. So. Uh, Mrs. Haley Loring. Uh, 
I'm short. <laughs> my name is Haley Loring. Uh, my address is 310 West Stat Street, Fort Ville, Indiana. I am a parent of three little boys that attend the district, and I'm a taxpayer in the district as well, okay. as I live here. <laughs> So I wanted to talk about how I feel the school is taking SEL in the direction and my concerns of which it might be going. After seeing the public Facebook post of Dr. Renee Aziz being brought into the retreat this summer, um, obviously there was a lot of parents outraged on Facebook. Um, I think that along with myself, we were a little bit shocked. Um, if you know a little bit about the company that she's from and what they represent and they stand for, which I do. Dr. Renee Aziz is a educational partnership and she works for Virtuoso. They teach on equity. She stands for, she sticks by saying that our uh, school district, all school districts are unconsciously biased and racist. She says that her goals are for equitable outcomes for our students. She also explores, she wants administrators to explore supporting equity. She leads culturally responsive teaching around white systemic racism in the school district. She believes in representing equity into the school in, ex in order to expose disparities among the African American community only. Dr. Renee Aziz explains how she brings her views into the school district with the following statement. She describes it as the same thing as cooking frogs. She says, it sounds gross, but you have to think about the right starting spot. And for a lot of schools, it's the right starting spot. It's not gonna be with conversations about systemic racism. It is to start with data and then ease into conversations about how the data does not benefit all students equally and have those things come to light. I quote, she says, we always get to those hard conversations, but we don't always start there. She supports and uses teachings on the intersectionality wheel in schools, which brings in sexualizing material and gender confusion to young, impressionable children, teaching children they are sexual from birth, encouraging exploration of self and choosing who you want to be, not limited to your biology. This is ideology. This is not meant for schools. Also, um, she runs advanced workshops on implicit bias in K through 12 as posted on the Virtuoso website. She did an interview with RWTV Indianapolis in which she explained how to speak with your children about racism and injustice, explaining that the impact of racism is such as air pollution. It's there whether you see it or not. We breathe it in like air, <clears throat> which I don't agree with. So um, she's basically saying that we need to teach our kids that no matter what, no matter how hard you work, there's gonna be an equitable outcome. Um, I don't believe that. I believe that our kids should be taught to work hard and earn their keep. And I think that equity is a socialistic view to teach our kids. Um, I don't believe that handouts are appropriate and to teach my kids to work hard to earn what they work for is important. Um, as far as transparency, which was posted on the website shortly after the backlash on the Facebook, school's Facebook page when she had come to the retreat, I feel like the best way to be transparent is to put the SEL curriculum publicly on the school page, easily for us to find. There's a lot of links on there that are very hard to find. You have to dig for them. You're five links in before you even find the calendar for the school board meetings. So um, I feel like that's a big issue. Parents maybe don't understand where the school stands as far as SEL, um, but that's the school needs to make that a little bit more aware and available for the community as we're, we all have kids that come here or we're paying for the public funding. Um, I believe that the school system, it's a great school system and I believe that you guys have the best interest in, but I don't believe that equity is, um, a good subject to be teaching in our school district. I believe the ideology, just as religion was taken out, needs to stay that way. And um, that's just where I stand. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, next on our list to speak is uh, Janet Smith. Hi, I'm Janet Smith. Uh, I spoke at the last board meeting um, on the dangers of the critical race theory. You might ask, why does this old lady keep coming to our board meetings and speaking? <laughs> Would you like to give your address real quick? We'll start the timer over. Oh, again. I'm sorry. 1200 Sandstone Court, Greenfield, Indiana. Yeah. 
So uh, I am a concerned American and I live in this district and my daughter graduated from Mount Vernon with Mr. Shelton's class and my son was vice principal here under Joe Loomis and I know many people in the Mount Vernon district and they're good people. After I spoke last month, a lady got up and said, we need equity in our schools. Do you know what that means? Equity means a forced equal outcome. Equality means an opportunity to accomplish or obtain something. They are two different things. It is impossible to have equal outcomes when everyone has the right to make decisions and those decisions will not be the same for each person. An example of equity would be if one student made a decision to study for tests and do his homework and the second student decided not to study for tests and not to do his homework, but both were given the same grade. That's forced equal outcome. That is equity. Equality is that both students were given the same assignments, the same tests, and each had the opportunity to study, but were graded on the results of their efforts. We do not want equity in our society, but equality. I asked last month where each of you stand on the critical race theory. This is a dangerous ideology and is closely related to the social emotional learning program that is being used uh, at the school, apparently. The Indiana Department of Education employability training video on SEL for teachers is on YouTube, and it talks about white supremacy, systemic racism, and ask, how can coaches help school teams that are reluctant to take steps to improve equity in school discipline? This is the Indiana Department of Education. I assume that means that those students who misbehave are to be treated the same as those who behave. That's equity. Forced equal outcomes. Did any of the counselors in your school attend ASCA 2021? Topics such as anti-racist school counseling in action were heard there. I'm not saying we should have, not have discussions about race relations or be aware of any discrimination that exists. I am definitely not in favor of any discrimination against anyone, but this all out effort by Marxist indoctrination to paint white people as oppressors and black people as victims is not something we should embrace. Black parents object to this as well as white parents, and I have seen them expressing their disapproval at school board meetings in Illinois and Virginia, to name a few. Khrushchev told President Eisenhower that his grandchildren's children would be living under communism, that they would take over America without firing a shot. And how would they do this? By infiltrating our education system and training our children to hate America. They already have done a good job on our colleges. Last week I saw several college students being interviewed on the street and not one of them said they were proud to be an American. Very sad. Is this what we want for our elementary and high school students? Each one of you on this board is the front line of defense to stop this in our area, and I thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, third on our speaking is Amanda Steele. My name is Amina Steele and my address is 525 Carroll Drive, Westfield, Indiana, 46074. I have a child that will be in second grade this year in the Mount Vernon District. Um, my child is um, actually from a unique family as uh, his parents are both female. Um, he has two moms. So um, the topic that I wanted to talk about is the um, SEL and, you know, we've had a lot these past two years um, that everyone has had to deal with. Um, you know, my child started kindergarten in school and ended it at home being taught. And, um, you know, it was kind of hard for everyone because we had to, you know, figure everything out. But my point to this is with everything that we're still dealing with when it comes to this, you know, catastrophe that is happening all over. Um, the last thing I wanted to worry about was what my child was going to be needing to learn when he came to school. Um, I teach my child that he can do whatever he wants to do, that he, cheat, that he treats every other child with respect and honor and is nice to them, includes them. And this 
curriculum that I've, you know, been researching on, which I'm a researcher by profession, clinical researcher, so I've been extremely busy these past two years with um, the pandemic, but I just don't understand why we would bring in more issues with what our children already need to learn. You know, they need to be able to come in and learn the basics, not come in and be, you know, um, the way I was taking it was almost interrogated by like how they're feeling, what they're doing, like just being a bit more intrusive than what really should be going on. And I want my child to know what's right and wrong from me, not from somebody else teaching them how they're supposed to be um, how their character is supposed to be, how they're supposed to act, because parents were the ones who teach our kids to treat people with respect. We're the ones who teach our kids how to control themselves. We're the ones who teach our kids how to be respectful. And I'm just tired of so much political propaganda being brought in with our children because my child does not need to deal with any of this. No child needs to deal with any of this. This, The learning that they need, they need to learn the things that I learned when I was in school. You know, I grew up inner city, Indianapolis. I went to IPS public schools until I was in eighth grade. And from when I was in school to how school is now is just completely different. And it's so politicized and just so out there. You know, I went to school with, with you know, many people of colors. I have best friends of color and it's, we need to teach our kids that they can be whatever they want to be and that nobody can stand in their way because right now it's adults standing in their way. It's adults not telling them that they can be whatever they want to be. It's adults telling them that they can't be a doctor because of their skin color. And that to me is just outrageous. A child can be whatever they want to be. We need to stop telling them that there's barriers. There are no barriers. They can be whatever they want to be. They can do whatever they want to do. And that's why I'm here today because I'm not only here speaking up for my child, I'm speaking up for every child. And every child needs to be heard. Every child needs to be understood. And we need to protect our children. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much. We appreciate that you took time to give us your opinions and speak. I know that's not easy to do, so we appreciate you joining us tonight and letting us know. Uh, the next item on our agenda is uh, item number seven. It's consent agenda items. It's the regular session minutes the claims, the personnel report, the overnight field trip request, donations, construction claims, all those things. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda items as presented? I move that we approve the consent agenda items as presented. Do I have a second? I'll second it. It's been moved by Chad, seconded by Phil. Any questions or discussions? All those in favor of the consent agenda items, raise your right hand. I can't see Phil. Phil, yes, okay. Motion carries 4-0. Um, item eight on our 8.1 is the second reading of uh, policies. Dr. Parker. Thanks so much. I brought to you for a first reading last month three policies, policy B200 membership. Policy E100, adoption of curricular materials, and policy G375, community use of school facilities. Um, thank you for your collaboration. Um, I'm ready to present these for a second reading um, and your approval if you so deem. Do I have a motion to approve the policies at the second reading? I'll make a motion to accept the policies as presented with a second reading. Do I have a second? I will second. It's been moved by Shannon, seconded by Phil. Any questions or discussions? The second was actually by Chad. Oh, sorry. Why? I don't know why I do that. I'm sorry. It's been moved by Shannon, seconded by Chad. Any questions? <coughs> All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 4-0. If I could take a quick moment. Yes. Um, 
I will share how much um, we appreciate um, Amy Matthews' guidance in our policies. Um, and as while she's here, we're, we're not able to do that publicly, but um, we've been working with her and um, her assistant helps out quite a bit too, um, for well over a year to recodify and change our policies. And she has a brand new package for us that we're gonna be starting with uh, first readings next month. So thank you for all your work and support, Amy. We really appreciate it. All right, item 8.2 on our agenda is pay scale adjustments for custodians and instructional assistants. Mr. Smedley? Yes, uh, tonight I'm asking for the board's consideration and approval of the adjustments to the proposed pay scales for custodians and instructional assistants that was contained in your packet. Uh, but before taking a vote on this, I'd like to provide a little background information, if I could, real quick, on why we're targeting these particular groups. Uh, this past spring, we, um, we conducted a market analysis of all of our classified groups just to kind of see how we ranked within our, our peer group of neighboring and districts around the state, similar to our size and demographics. And we also compared our minimum and maximum rates uh, to state averages as well. Uh, and, and, and overall, um, we, were, we ranked favorably in, in some areas and not so favorably in, in other areas. But particularly with these two groups, uh, we, we identified one, one main issue of concern, and that is the hiring and retention rate of these two groups in particular over the last uh, few years. Um, it's, it's kind of been a, an ongoing issue. E even when we're able to fill these positions, most of them leave within a year or two. So we felt like maybe if we could make it more attractive with adjusting these pay rates, it may help us in both the hiring and retaining of these employees. So that's why we, we focused on these two groups. We realize that there are other groups that we need to address moving forward, um, and, and we plan to do so. Uh, we're currently developing a plan to, to be able to do that um, over a period of time in the coming months and years um, based on what is fiscally manageable and responsible within our budget. So tonight, at least for, for this board meeting, we're, we're seeking approval for adjustments for these two groups. Um, we also recognize, too, that um, we anticipate being able to apply a raise later in the year to all classified groups once we once we settle with the teachers association during our formal bargaining season which typically falls around november or december as well so even though we're not going to adjust the pay scales for all groups uh, this evening we do anticipate being able to give out raises to those groups as well later on so with that being said um, again we were just seeking your your uh, approval of this recommendation <laughs> to approve um, the pay scale adjustments for custodians and instructional assistants. I'll make a motion to approve the adjustments for custodians and instructional assistants. Well deserved. Do I have a second? I'll second. It's been moved by Shannon, seconded by Phil. Did I get that right? Okay. Do we have any questions or discussion? I want to say, I, it's not a question, but I, I appreciate the work on this as a teacher, keeping IAs and custodians it's so important, it makes everybody's life easier, and if we can retain them, it's, it's such a plus, and I, I appreciate that we can do this, and I appreciate your work on this. All in favor of approving the adjustments, raise your right hand. Or zero. Thank you very much. Three on the agenda is the tiered health and safety protocol for the 2021-2022. It's the updates, Dr. Mr. Shelton. As we just discussed uh, in pretty good detail, we would just like to get your approval for the health and safety uh, protocols and plan for the 2021-22 school year if you don't have any questions about it. Do I have a motion to approve the health and safety protocol? I make a motion that we uh, accept this and approve it. Do I have a second? It's been moved by Phil, seconded by Shannon. Any questions or discussion? I feel like we went over time to change it, so. Did I get it wrong again? No. It's just snickering. We did go over it well. I, I hate that we have to do it, but I think it's well put together and thorough. Right. All right, those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 4 0. Item 8.4. Of the Fortville Vernon Township Public Library Board. 
That's Ashley Jenkins. And are you presenting that? Uh, I know the story. Um, Oh, Melissa Dragoo, um, our Vernon Township Fortville um, librarian, is recommending Ashley Jenkins to be reappointed to the board. Um, that is a Mount Vernon board appointment, mm -hmm. so that requires action by you for her to be on that board, and she has her letter stating that she is indeed glad to continue to serve. But it is something you need to um, reapprove, please. Yes, you all have the letter there, so do I have a motion to approve <laughs> Ashley to the Fortville Vernon Township Public Library Board? I'll make the motion to approve Ashley to the Fortville Vernon Township Library Board. Do I have a second? second. Been moved by Phil, seconded by Shannon. Any questions or discussion? Someone's going to have to change their voice or something. I heard you say it even. It's been moved by Chad, seconded by Shannon. Any questions or discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 4-0. Um, item 9 on our agenda is announcements. Dr. Parker. Thank you so much. Um, school starts next Thursday. <laughs> I think our one child in attendance has left already, or she would be jumping up and down about how excited she is for school to start next Thursday. Um, I will remind folks that are here, and we'll continue to push this out, that our balance calendar in our early release um, states that we will not have early release the very first and the very last Wednesday of the school year. Um, for us this year, the first Wednesday is actually the fifth school day, but we want to keep with that um, pro practice um, that we will not have early release the first and last Wednesday. Um, faculty and staff return on Monday. We have a quick celebration. Then Teachers will be with their principals in their buildings, learning all the processes and procedures and getting rolling for the school year. The Tuesday of next week, our teachers will be working in their PLCs. Uh, Mr. Shipley and um, team have worked to provide a day of exploration of our curriculum as well as our common assessments. So it's like all of our third grade teachers in the entire district for an entire day will be able to be together. That is so cool. So um, we are really excited to be able to have our teachers to dig into their curriculum and assessments. Um, make recommendations for changes, but they're the ones that drive that, that ship um, with a great leadership of Scott and his department. And then on Wednesday, um, the day before school starts, is really time for staff to work in their rooms and to tidy things up and, you know, seating and materials for the first day of school so that they have time uh, for kids to come the next day, which is Thursday. We are excited in case you didn't know. Yeah. All right, item 10 on our ag agenda is adjournment. I'll need a motion to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn at 7.50 p.m. <coughs> Do I have a second? second? It's been moved by Shannon, seconded by Phil. Uh, all in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries 4-0. We'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for...